In this section, we're going to talk about evaluating forecast distributional accuracy. This is in contrast to the previous section where we were evaluating point forecast accuracy. Now we're interested in how well does our whole distribution uh, relate to what actually happened. First of all, we'll set up an example by using code that we've already used previously in this section. I just need to set up the the relevant object so that we can do the evaluation. Um, so just to quickly run you through this to remind you what each section does. The first part computes, uh, takes the, the stock price data that's in the package and filters out just the Google stock price from 2015 onwards, and then re-indexes it using the number of trading days since the start of the series rather than the date, because there's days where no trading occurs. Then we use 2015 as our training set and use January 2016 as the test set. Then we fit three models, the three benchmark models that don't involve seasonality because stock prices are not seasonal. So we're using the mean, the naive and the drift methods. And lastly, we take those fitted models and we forecast for the periods occupied by the test set for the days in January 2016. Okay, let's have a look at the at the forecasts that we obtained to see how well they look compared to the what actually occurred. So here we are, take the, the forecast object, filter out just the mean forecasts, as in the, the forecast from the model mean, and then we'll plot it against the training data, Google 2015, and the test data, Google Jan 2016, um, joined up together. So you'll see that the black series goes all the way through the forecast period. Um, and we can compare our forecast distribution, which is shown here as two prediction intervals, the 80% and the 95% interval, as well as the mean, the blue line. And we can compare that against the black, which is our uh, the actuals that occurred. And in this case, it doesn't look so good. Uh, the black line is almost always outside the 80% interval, whereas in practice, you would expect it to be inside the 80% interval 80% of the time. And it's never outside the 95% interval, but in practice, you'd expect it to be outside the 95% interval about 5% of the time. We look at the naive forecasts, uh, same graph, just changing the forecast method. Uh, we'll see it looks a little better, but um, it's now within the 80% region some of the time, but not really enough of the time. It's less than 80% of the time. And none of them still go outside the 95% region. And if we look at the drift method, uh, it's a little worse than the naive method, but not as bad as the mean method. So we can do those sorts of judgments by just looking at plots of prediction intervals and plots of actuals. But what we want to do in this section is to try to make that a little more objective so that we can uh, we can score how well our methods are doing. Um, particularly when we have a lot of forecasts, we don't want to be looking at lots of graphs. We need a way of doing the doing the measuring how accurate they how accurate they are in some numerical fashion. So to do that, we're going to have to introduce quantile forecasts. So when I plot a 80% interval, you think about this upper bound and the lower bound like that, they are actually quantiles. An 80% interval captures 80% of the probability so that the upper bound is at the 90th percentile and the lower bound is at the 10th percentile. So there's a chance of one in 10 of being up here um, in this region and a chance of one in 10 being down in this region, um, and 80% of the time it's in the middle. So if we think of those as quantiles, then we can think about, well, how do you evaluate how good a quantile is? And to do that, we use what's called a quantile score. So if I let F uh, subscript P comma T be the quantile forecast with probability P at time T, um, and then if Y is what we actually what actually happens, the observation, then you would expect that um, the proportion of times Yt is less than Fpt is P. 
Okay, so if it's a, if p is 0.9, so it's at the 90th percentile, then you'd expect the proportion of times y is less than that is, is 0.9. If p is 0.5, so it's the median of the distribution, then you'd expect about half the time the actual value to be below that and about half the time to be above that. So the probability of your observation being less than the quantile is given by p, by the probability in the subscript. Now we score them, we score our quantile forecast using this formula. Um, just have a look at how this works. So you'll see both parts of this equation have a section like that. And there it is again. It's the absolute difference between what you, what actually happened and what you predicted would happen, as in what is the predicted quantile of the future distribution. Now, you expect, you don't expect uh, y to be that close to f if p is not close to 0.5. So we need to weight that, that um, error, the distance between y and f, by the probability. So it's going to be, y is going to be less than f, uh, a proportion p of the time, and it's going to be greater than f, a proportion 1 minus p of the time. So we weight the first one by 1 minus p, and we weight the second one by p. So that gives them a weight based on what how likely it is to be um, above or below those positions in the distribution. Um, and then the last thing you do is you multiply the whole thing by 2. And the reason for that is so that it's a bit more interpretable. Remember, if p is 0.5, you're sitting on the median of the distribution. Um, and if p is 0.5, then 1 minus p is also 0.5. So the, the uh, constant out the front here becomes 1, and the constant out the front here becomes 1. So both of these become simply the absolute error. So when p is 0.5, q is the same as the absolute error. Uh, and it gives us that nice interpretation if we put the 2 in front. Some books won't do that. They won't put 2 in front. Um, but then you lose the neat connection between uh, absolute error and quantile scores. Okay, let's graph this equation, this q as a function of p. And if we do that, we have a uh, piecewise linear function that looks like this, where it's on the, on the horizontal axis is the distance between the observation and the, and the uh, quantile forecast. So that's, the, that's this guy here. Um, and on the vertical axis, you've got q, the quantile score. So the further away you, you are, away from uh, what you, the further y is from f, uh, the bigger the, um, the score is, but it's weighted based on what the value of p is. So when p is very small, it's weighted high on the left, but low on the right. When p is very large, it's weighted low on the left, but high on the right, to take into account the probability of you being in that part of the distribution. Uh, so in general, a low value of p is a low value of q, sorry, is good here, whatever the value of p is. Um, we multiply by two to give us a better interpretation of the result. It's like an absolute error, but it's weighted to account for the likely exceedance of that particular quantile. So that's how you do quantile scoring. Now, in Fable, we can easily do these computations using the accuracy function just as we did for point forecast, but instead of putting, um, instead of using the defaults, we say we want a quantile score and you say what probability you want. So if you ask for probability of 0.1, then it comes back and says, this is the quantile score. So that's using the equation on the previous slide. If we ask for probability of 0.9, then here's our quantile score, a little worse. So the model is better at, estimating the 0.1 quantile than it is at estimating the 0.9 quantile. And together, these two quantiles give us that 80% interval. If we're interested in evaluating an interval, then we can actually use these two quantile scores in this way. So if we've got a 100 times 1 minus alpha percent prediction interval, so if it's an 80% interval, alpha is 0.2, um, and if we write it as a lower value and an upper value like that, then the, the um, Winkler score, named after forecaster Bob Winkler, 
is <clears throat> simply the sum of the two m's, the quantiles at the ends of the interval, divided by alpha. So in this case, it would be um, the q of point 1 plus q of point 0.9 divided by point 0.2. And that would give us the Winkler score. A little bit of algebra um, will lead you to uh, realize that the Winkler score can be re-expressed in this manner, where <clears throat> you've got the, the width of the interval, u minus l, so that's the total width of your interval, <clears throat> plus a penalty if you're outside that interval. So if you're inside the interval, there's no penalty. You're in the middle line here. If you're below the interval, if, you're, if the actual is below your lower value, then you cop this penalty. The further below you are, the bigger the penalty. And if your actual value is above the upper limit, so again, you're outside the interval, but on the other side, you cop this penalty. Again, the further outside the interval you are, the bigger the penalty. Um, <clears throat> so in you can think of the Winkler score as the width of the interval plus a penalty if you miss the actual observation. And the and uh, so there's a trade-off here. You don't you want to make an interval as small as possible, but if it's too small, you're going to miss too often, and then you're going to hit get lots of penalties. If you make your interval too wide, um, then you're not going to get penalized, but you're going to cop. You know, this part of the formula every time. Uh, and the, the penalty is designed to perfectly balance the situation for that type of interval, for that value of alpha. To do this in Fable, we use exactly the same form uh, code as before, but instead of quantile score, we use Winkler score. And you put in a level, which is the um, percentage coverage of your prediction interval. In this case, I'm choosing 80 and it comes back with 55.7 as the score for that particular um, prediction interval for that particular method. Now, remember, this is simply the quantile score at the lower end plus the upper end divided by alpha. And so this number, 55.7, is actually 4.86 plus 6.28 divided by 0.2. Of course, we're not just interested in certain prediction intervals. We're actually interested in the whole probability distribution. And in that case, we're interested in all the values of P. If we average the quantile score over every possible value of P between 0 and 1, we get what's called the continuous ranked probability score, or the CRPS value. Again, you can compute this easily in Fable. You just ask for the CRPS um, in the accuracy function. So remember, this is averaging over all the possible p-values, over all the possible prediction intervals that you could produce. And it's telling us that the uh, naive method has the lowest value, so it's the best of these methods, a little better than drift and a lot better than the mean method. So even though it didn't look perfect when we looked at the graph, it's the best of the three. And if you uh, were wanting to do better, you would be trying to reduce this number. You'd be trying to find a method that gives you a better value than the naive method for this particular data set. These, these values are actually in the units of the data. So they're in US dollars in the case of Google stock price. Um, so we're interested in, uh, we might be interested in comparing the CRPS value for Google stock price against something completely different. So if you want to do that, you need to remove the units. So for point forecasts, we did things like scaled errors. For, um, for distribution forecasts, uh, a more natural thing to do is to use what's called a skill score. So a skill score provides an accuracy measure relative to some benchmark method, which is often the naive method or the seasonal naive method. So if we're interested in CRPS and we want to know, well, how good is our model, we can compute the CRPS of our method. It's this guy. And we subtract it from the CRPS of the benchmark and then divide by the CRPS of the benchmark. And that'll give us how much better our method is proportionally to the naive method. And what you can think of this as a proportional improvement that you get by using whatever method you've chosen to use. 
so here we are applying it to um, the forecast that we've obtained. You, in the accuracy function, you just put in skill score as your function. And inside that, you put in what function you're using in the comparison. And you can put anything there. You can put mean squared error or mean absolute error or whatever you want inside the skill score. We're using CRPS here. So we put that inside and it tells us, it comes back with the skill values here. And it tells us that naive is zero. Well, that makes sense because you're subtracting the CRPS of naive minus the CRPS of your method, which if it's naive, you're going to get a zero. So that's always going to be zero. Um, the other two are negative. The other two values here are negative, saying that they're actually worse, um, worse than uh, CRPS naive. The drift method is, um, you know, 20, nearly 27% worse, and the mean method is nearly twice as bad as the naive method. In general, you're looking for the, the method that has the largest positive value here, the in most improvement over your benchmark method. Okay, so that's how you uh, compare forecast accuracy, whether you're looking at individual quantiles or prediction intervals or the whole distribution, you can use these methods to evaluate your forecasts.